Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to explore the projection view pattern. Something that I came up with while working on my projects at work. This is going to be a four part uh, video. Uh, we will go through starting an MVC application and morphing it all the way to the projection view pattern. Along the way, we're going to implement vertical slices by uh, Jimmy Bogard and uh, future queries. So let's start with part one. In part one, we're just going to look at a basic MVC application as if we are just starting out with MVC. Basically, this is not the, the right way to do it, but it's how a lot of applications in MVC start and end. The controllers of our application are going to house pretty much all of the logic and we're going to interact with the database entities directly. So let's get started. Let's look at the controllers. So this is going to be a very small admin system of sorts for a construction company. We're only going to look at jobs and employees, nothing else. We have three controllers, the dashboard controller, which creates a view that lists the employee count and the job count, and then it gets the currently signed in employee. Then we have the employees controller, which gets the signed in employee as well, but it also lists the employees. And then when you're editing an employee, it lists the employees jobs. And then lastly, we have the jobs controller. It does the same thing as the other two where it grabs the currently signed in employee, but it also adds jobs and uh, edits jobs and lists jobs. Pretty simple. So let's actually run it. Okay, here we are. So we're listing on the dashboard the 10 employees that we have and the 15 jobs that we have. And then right here, we're listing the currently signed in user. On every refresh, this is randomized. So now if we go into the jobs list, you can see here's the list of jobs and a little bit of information about them. The important thing about this is if we look at the top left corner here, is that we are grabbing everything about the job, whether we need it or not. And then we're also getting the currently signed in user. The problem is that all of these are for each query, we're opening a connection and then we're closing the connection. And then the same with employees. Here's the list of employees. If we go in back into the jobs and then if we go back into a specific job like this one, then you can see how this gets amplified. There's now seven queries to grab data to build out the view. So specifically we're grabbing the job information itself and then we're grabbing the information to populate the dropdowns like the CSRs, the states, the statuses and the types. If we go into employees, drill down into an employee, here's the employee and then the list of jobs that they're related to. And of course there's three queries to compose all of this. So the problem with this is that we are putting all of our logic into the controller and that's generally frowned upon. There should be a separation. So let's look at how we can accomplish this separation and improve our application. All right, now we're in part two. So here we are going to introduce the vertical slices by Jimmy Bogart. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to take the individual views and make them into isolated slices. And when we do that, the controllers are only responsible for forwarding the requests to the slice handlers and possibly receiving their responses. So let's take a look. As you can see, the project structure has changed. Let me open part one. 
So this is the basic model view controller structure. We have now taken that and rearranged it for the most part and just compacted it into a features structure. So basically a lot of the controllers or well, basically all of the controllers and the models and the views were combined into their own isolated features. So here is our dashboard and then the default view basically became this. But let me show you the controllers. So here's the dashboard controller and let me show you the original. So this is the part one controller and then here is the part two controller. As you can see, the controller doesn't do anything except fire off a, a request to the view handler and possibly, and in this case, it's waiting for the view to be returned so that it can render the actual view. Let's look at the employees controller. Same thing here. The only thing that controllers are doing is forwarding off the requests. And then let's look at the jobs controller, which has the most changes. Okay, here they are. As you can see, the jobs controller in part one is very complex versus the jobs controller of part two, which again, all it does is forward off the requests to the handlers. The handlers themselves, let's look at edit for jobs. The handlers are broken down into two parts. We have the query for a job where we're asking for a job by ID. We're building up the view by querying the database. Here's the view model, and then we're sending it back. And then once we're, let's say we make a change, we hit save, then we're sending off a command, and then we're just applying the changes to the job and saving it, and that's it. Let's show this in action. Okay, we're in part two. So pretty much everything is the same as far as data access. We're still doing a very sloppy job there, but all of our views, all of our actions are isolated to themselves. They don't know about any other action or slice, so they're not affected by and they're not affecting other slices and they all still do the exact same job. So let's move on to part three. All right, now we're in part three. So in part three, we're going to improve our data access by introducing the Entity Framework Plus Future Queries, again, by recommendation of Jimmy Bogard. Basically what future queries will allow us to do is rather than send individual queries one at a time, we send all of the queries once and that's it. We're not overloading the database with multiple queries just to build out the view for one request. Let's take a peek at that. The primary change, let me pull up the jobs controller, or not controller, I'm sorry, the jobs edit. So here is part two, jobs edit. We'll look at the query specifically. And then here is part three, jobs edit. What we have now is we have moved all of the queries a little bit higher up and they're all now future queries, as you can see by this future extension. And basically what happens is once this view returns and we either call the, for the value of a single future query or for the list of a future query, they all get invoked in one batch, the results come back, then we just fill in our view model. Let's see this in action. So same thing as before, let's go into the job, as you can see in part two, we have seven queries, which is fine, but they're all individual queries. Now in part three, there's still seven queries, but they're all in one request. So we're not opening and closing connections between each and every one of them. And that's it for part three.
we've now improved our data access. So now let's look at the actual projection view pattern that this video is about. So let's go to part four. All right, welcome back to part four. So here we are going to complete this projection view pattern. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to separate the database projections from the view that gets sent to the user. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's jump into an example. So let's open up jobs again. So this is part three, job edit. And then we'll look at part four, job edit. Let's look at the queries again. So here the query handler changes up a little bit because we're separating the projections from the views. So we have a projection class and then we have a view class. The projection class holds on to all the future queries. And it's, ba it's basically a container to build up your future queries. So you build up your queries here. And then the actual handler base, let's look at that. So we build up our queries, then we get the projection, we map it, which invokes the queries at that point. It gets mapped to the view. We may need to do some manual editing of some pieces that are just not easy to express to AutoMapper. And then we hand back the view. So it does everything the same way. Well, no, it doesn't. It, it still gives you the same result, but the way it goes about it is a little bit different. So you might wonder, why do we want to do that? Well, sometimes your projection is not the same as your view. You may be projecting a lot of bits and pieces that don't necessarily translate directly to the view. Maybe they're helper pieces. It's better to think of your projections as one process, as one action, and your views as another. So let's run part four. And we'll go back into the jobs. First job, still the exact same thing. We're still performing seven queries in one batch, but this is now separated behind the scenes into a projection and then a view. Now, in this example, this doesn't do much, unfortunately. <laughs> so I guess it's a bad example. But in my work project, I have well over 200 slices that implement this projection view pattern. And it has helped me separate my projection requirements from my view requirements. So that's pretty much it for the projection view pattern. It's Pretty simple, just a slight enhancement to Jimmy's vertical slices architecture. If you want to take a look at the examples, I will be posting them to GitHub and you can see how they've progressed from one to two to three to four. Try giving it a shot in your application and see if it helps you in separating your projection requirements from your view requirements. So that's it. If you like this video, please leave a like, helps me out. We'll see you in the next one.